All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to our fall. Thank you for coming, rather, to our fall uh, education session for the AAP Section on Emergency Medicine A uh, Education Subcommittee. Um, we've had themes in the past, um, like educational leadership and discussing procedure training and the ACGME recommendations that still aren't out yet and will probably be released in February. Um, and we know that many of you teach medical students and residents and fellows and colleagues, but there's a ton of work going on outside our institutions and in our institutions to teach other populations of learners. And so our main goal for today's session was to bring together experts in different domains for them to share their experience in how they teach people other than medical trainees and our, our traditional learners. So I'm going to allow our three presenters and our special guest master of ceremonies uh, to introduce themselves. And then we'll get started with three brief presentations and then a moderated discussion and q and A. I'm going to be in the background manning the ones and zeros and keeping the timing and checking the, the chat log. So if you have any questions or issues that come up, um, hit me up in the background. Uh, but why don't we start with you, Caitlin? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for uh, having us. I'm Caitlin Farrell. I'm PEM faculty at Boston Children's. Um, I've had the pleasure of learning from a lot of you on the call, and so hopefully um, this will be some familiar themes, but I'll be talking today about EMS and education for the PEM side. Okay. And Michael. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Goldman. I'm faculty at Yale. Um, excited to have one of my mentors here, Mark Auerbach, sort of cheering on as always. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you guys later about our experience using an echo uh, to reach community uh, emergency department teams. And Adam. Hey, everyone. I'm Adam Vukovic. I'm one of the PEM faculty here in Cincinnati, and I am one of the assistant program directors for our residency program here. I am going to be talking a little bit how about how we have married uh, communication with patients and families to optimize outcomes and hopefully improve their experience along the way. And Adam gets one bonus point for having the most festive backdrop. <laughs> We are jealous of his well-decorated tree. Um, and certainly, last but not least, uh, Tiwodi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Dia Wodi. I am a first-year PEM fellow at Cincinnati Children's, um, and I'm excited to be a part of this today. All right. Caitlin, I'm going to make you the co-host so that you can share your slides. I'm going to share. And hopefully you're seeing some slides. Perfect. I'm just going to shrink myself. Awesome. All right. I will try to be brief and comprehensive at the same time. So we're going to talk a little bit about pediatric education for EMS providers. Our roadmap for my little section today is we're going to talk a little bit about EMS and PEM and why this is an important learner audience for us to consider as PEM faculty. We'll talk about pediatric simulation for EMS, some of the groundwork laid by uh, others before me, and then our city partnership here in Boston, as well as our statewide collaboration with the Massachusetts EMSC. A little bit about some of the benefits, both measurable benefits and some of the less tangible benefits that we found working with this group and some lessons learned, hopefully to inspire others to take up this work. I've designed it as a bit of a sales pitch for the med ed folks. So hopefully other people will be interested in getting more engaged. So my EMS story starts in high school. Um, my small town had a volunteer ambulance squad and they had difficulty getting coverage during the daytime hours. And so petitioned the state of Massachusetts for a special waiver to let high school students take the EMTP curriculum, pass the state exam, and then respond to 911 calls from the high school. Uh, many of us did not have a driver's license, and so the custodians would drive us in this cruiser to respond to 911 calls. And this is my first simulation. So that's me in the triage vest, age 16. This was our first mass casualty drill. We designed a training that we did um, right before the prom, simulating a drunk driving accident with multiple casualties. And we did it at the high school with the students able to watch from the field. And we did it as a training exercise with the fire department, with extrication and the whole bit. And so this was my first MCI drill, my first simulation, and really the start of my career in pediatric emergency medicine, as well as EMS simulation. And so that's why I care about EMS and working with our EMS colleagues to improve their educational experience around children. But 
I will make the case, I think that you all should care about it too. And so we know that 30 million patients transported by EMS annually in the United States. And so that's a lot of patients, but children's are, children are only 7% of all EMS activation. So for any given EMT or paramedic, it's very few children they'll see on a given shift or even in a given month or a given year. But collectively for us as PEM folks, this is more than 2 million children each year are cared for by emergency medical services and transported in ambulances. And so our ability to touch this group and improve their pediatric knowledge can um, reach lots of children. Lots of folks have done work to identify what are the barriers to quality pre-hospital pediatric care. There's limited initial training in the initial certification, very little pediatric content in the initial certification phase. And then, as I mentioned, there's infrequent exposure to pediatric cases, and this leads to provider discomfort with pediatric patients. And as we know from a lot of work from folks on this call and in the subcommittee as well, pediatric readiness really does improve outcomes. And so we want to move forward in making folks feel more pediatric ready at the EMS level. The National Pediatric Readiness Project has a specific pre-hospital arm looking at pre-hospital pediatric readiness, recognizing that more than 80% of EMS agencies see less than eight children per month. And so with this infrequent exposure, developing checklists and toolkits and resources so that EMS providers can feel more prepared. That takes us a little bit to how we got into simulation. So for EMS and simulation, we know critically ill pediatric patients are low frequency, high stakes events. And we know that simulation provides a useful tool for critical pediatric assessment. There's been lots of work um, throughout the, the subcommittee on EMS and simulation. And so in, in needs assessments and surveys, more than 50% of EMTs report highly realistic simulations are how they learn best. Um, the PD Steps group at Texas Children's with Houston Fire Department have a, a longstanding relationship with uh, excellent results. And so their simulation curriculum positively impacts pediatric protocol adherence. And so participating in this curriculum um, and following outcomes, they demonstrated that improved use of intranasal and intramuscular midaz for actively seizing pediatric patients, improved use of IM epinephrine for anaphylaxis, and and giving pre-hospital steroids for asthmatics resulted in a decreased ED length of stay. The PRIDE Collaborative was a multi-state collaborative looking at simulation to improve pediatric disaster triage. And the Pediatric Emergency Assessment in Kids group, another longitudinal program with simulation improving assessment, improving medication volume and fluid administration for children. So we know this can work to bring benefit to our EMS colleagues and the care they provide to children. So learning from these groups, we developed our own local pediatric simulation, working with Boston EMS. So Boston EMS is a large urban municipal EMS agency. They run a tiered BLS ALS response and have about 130 or so annual incidents. But similar to our national numbers, only 5% are for children under 15. When we started our curriculum, we began with a needs assessment and they self-identified infants, children with special health care needs and respiratory emergencies as the situations and cases they felt least comfortable with. And we also identified recent protocol changes for BLS providers, such as check and inject epinephrine. Using this needs assessment, we developed small group high fidelity simulations and we integrated procedural skills throughout our cases. Our first year of this collaborative, we did an educational study looking at um, 213 EMTs and paramedics at Boston EMS. Our intervention was the pediatric simulation cases debriefed with PEM staff in a case-based didactic. Our analysis was pretty simple. We just did pre-post-test assessment, and then we did a follow-up assessment with survey six months later. Just briefly, a little of our highlights. So the median knowledge assessment at baseline was 80% with the interquartile range there. Post-curriculum rose to 89% with a mean improvement of 9% and a few pictures of some of our debriefs. Even though we know that confidence doesn't always match competence, we did measure it just so we get a sense of um, what crews thought of the program on our first off and 100% found the session helpful, which is what every educator wants to hear. 93% um, reported improved confidence, and perhaps more meaningful, 20% reported they used skills they learned in the training in the subsequent six months of actual patient care. 
We also identified this was a really mutually beneficial relationship. Um, the EMTs and paramedics really appreciated the real-time feedback with the PEM docs, and we really enjoyed getting to know our colleagues. Um, now we have lots of familiar faces coming through the emergency department, and my colleagues got to learn a lot about EMS and really what a two-man or a four-man crew can get accomplished for really sick kids. The success of this program in Boston led to a statewide collaboration through the Massachusetts EMSC. We are very lucky in Massachusetts to have many academic pediatric emergency departments. And so each PEDS ED was paired with its geographic EMS region. Again, we started with needs assessment to help inform our curriculum. We developed the curriculum together. We pooled our simulation resources and expertise. And we had a total of 34 physicians, two nurses, five paramedics, and nine SIM engineers who put on five eight-hour pediatric training days over six months across the state. This is um, Massachusetts, our green stars are the locations of our training and the red dots represent an EMT or a paramedic from each of those communities um, participating in our program. Again, we just did kind of simple pre post test assessment with a 9.8 improvement in post training score and some retention of that improvement at the six month follow up. As often is the case, our six month follow up had pretty low response rate. But what was really striking and what kind of keeps us moving forward in work like this is that 83% of respondents reported no additional pediatric teaching, like none, not SIM, nothing, just any pediatric uh, teaching in the six months after they participated in our curriculum. 72% had no additional SIM training, but more than half reported they used things they learned at the training in actual patient care. And we had kind of free text narrative um, with people able to put in stories of things that they learned and care that they were able to provide. So stepping back and thinking about our work so far and where we're headed, I'd say some of our important lessons learned is really early involvement of stakeholders and understanding what are the needs, what are the resources, um, making sure that we have needs assessment to divide curriculum development. It's not useful to teach just what you wanna teach if it's not really what they need to learn or what they have deficiencies or worries about. And anytime we run SIM off our site, it's really helpful to do dry run, test equipment, find the connections, uh, make sure we have the resources and the setup that we need. And I can't really emphasize this enough is benefiting from others' experience. Manish and um, everybody in Texas and the Marks in Connecticut have been really generous with their experience and their time. Um, and I've been able to learn a lot from their work ahead of me so I could kind of start two steps ahead with all of their lessons learned already. And I think we weren't expecting it, but it's been really, really a mutually beneficial relationship for the PEM staff and the fellows. EMS is an important piece of the ABP emergency medicine boards and getting the fellows integrated in the medical control idea and scope of practice earlier on has been beneficial. And just having kind of friendly, familiar faces in the department as the EMS crews roll by has been um, really a nice silver lining for us. If you're thinking this sounds like an audience that you're interested in working with, but you don't really have the bandwidth to say, let me develop a simulation curriculum for the city or for the state, um, there are lots of smaller ways that we're involved with our EMS communities locally. So we do a lot of case reviews, kind of as simple as I get an email saying the crew's worried about how this kid's doing. Can you give us some feedback? How did it go? Should they have done this? Um, and so those little emails back and forth to training captains or medical directors can be really powerful to give them feedback on how a child did and decisions that they made or provide sport when cases go um, not well. And it really helps with the relationship building for EMS leaders in the community. And then hopefully folks are all involved with their EMSC at the state level. All of our states have OEMS um, regulations that inform the pediatric protocols for kids cared for by EMS providers. And it's really important that we have PEM voices um, informing all of those protocols. And so by being involved with EMSC, you can oversee the protocols through your state OEMS um, office. And again, just highlighting the opportunity to bring your fellows along when you're participating in some of these programs. What's next for us? We are in about two months doing our fifth annual Boston EMS PD SIM series running in January and February. The Massachusetts EMSC continues to be active. We're supporting PALS courses for EMS providers. We're piloting the AAP VR curriculum for EMS um, and working with some regional and statewide case reviews, um, which is one of the benefits of Zoom is that we can get large groups together to talk through cases together. 
Um, and then I'm happy to be participating in the IMPACTS EMS Collaborative, which is a multi-center collaboration looking to both educate and assess via simulation. Um, tons of folks who have been uh, part of all of these projects that I'm very grateful for. And I'm happy to take questions when we move to the panel. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Caitlin. I can think back what I uh, donned in terms of clothing back when I was 16. And I worked at a store called Record Rama. So obviously your experience was much more formative um, in terms of your journey to pediatrics. Uh, and I wanted to call it one of the comments I got in the chat uh, was your story really showed why you cared early on and, and showed a deep linkage to the population you're serving. Um, Michael, I'm going to make you co-host your, your dream so that you can share. There you go. All right, just making sure folks can see like a big colorful PEM echo slide and you can hear me okay. All right, so uh, I'll get going. Um, so again, I'm Michael coming from Yale and I'm gonna to talk to everyone today about the PEM echo program. I put the dates for when we were actively involved in this because I think you'll find it relevant in a minute. Pre-pandemic where Zoom was like new and novel. Um, so we'll get back to that in, in a few minutes. Um, but before I really go into what we do, I think it's super important to start out by saying, you really got to have friends. Uh, I think that goes with any sort of professional pursuits uh, and and all that. And so for this specific project, I just want to thank Gunjan Tiagura and Mark Auerbach uh, for getting me involved in the ECHO program at Yale. They were the ECHO kind of gurus amongst many other uh, gurus, that, <laughs> topics that they are. Um, so I appreciate their mentorship for this project and others. Um, and then, you know, you got to have sponsors too. So I know that Melissa and Josh, there's Josh Nagler and Miss Langan ran into Brad at a recent AAP conference and, and this came up. So I appreciate the opportunity again to share our experience. So um, my goal uh, for talking with you all the next nine minutes or so is to sort of try and model some educational stuff. And so you'll hear me refer to, I already have referred to sponsorship versus mentorship. Um, I will kind of highlight Bloom's taxonomy next. I will show what Kern's six-step model and Kirkpatrick hierarchy of outcomes. None of these things I'm going to go into in depth, but if you're interested or if you're like, what is that? I'd be happy to chat after. Um, and then by the end of this session specifically, I hope you all will be able to define terms ECHO, EMSC, and PEC, and we'll go into that, um, describe our PEM ECHO story, and then discuss and reflect during the uh, conversation at the end sort of like how this echo learning model can reach novel learners in your different areas of practice. So again, uh, we'll go from here. So what is echo? Um, I think the graphic is a little bit busy, but I think it catches the the fine, you know, the meaning here. Um, can folks see my cursor or does it have to be over here? Yeah, okay, cool. So um, it starts at the top where you have like subject matter, matter experts um, and they, meet with folks in the community. Ideally, these are providers that are interacting with people on a first-hand basis. The whole idea came out of University of New Mexico, a very rural region where folks at the medical center were having excellent outcomes for the hepatitis C in their patients, but folks in the distant communities were struggling. And so the subject matter experts formed a community of practice with local providers to sort of get them up to speed as to how best take care of hepatitis C, how best to reach their local patients and the people in their own communities. So bringing this expert knowledge to the communities as opposed to expecting everyone to make the big trip to the big academic medical center. And I think what I really wanna call out about this diagram and this model is a couple of factors. One, this idea of learning loops uh, in that the um, subject matter experts definitely should show up and think about learning as much from the experience as they hope to impart on the um, folks that are sort of like the first-hand recipients of the information. Um, what's thought is that the subject matters think about how they can impart their practice and their expertise in culturally and geographically diverse care settings and not with all the amazing like resources and opportunities that one has at an academic medical center. So there's tons of learning that goes in a bi-directional manner. And then in doing so and in discussing issues and barriers to excellence in care and whatnot, this community of practice forms. So this means, you know, a group of folks organized together towards a mutually benefit, you know, a mutually you know, an idealistic goal. Um, and they're working through barriers. They're discussing different synergies to bring expert medical, you know, practice in this case, um, 
to the patients in where they are most set up to find these patients. Um, I would say one of the biggest things um, that ECHO strives to do is to improve patient outcomes through telementoring as opposed to telemedicine. So not trying to cut out the middleman, but really, really prepare that middle person to really do the job to the best of their ability. Um, and again, at a convenient way to reach patients. Um, so I'll talk through our specific project and how it pertains to pediatric emergency medicine and EMSC, many of the concepts that Caitlin has already figured, but I'll use this tool um, this is current six steps of curriculum development and evaluation. And the reason I presented is I thought that the majority of the audience were people new to medical education. And so this is a, a method. This is a methodological approach to developing and evaluating a curriculum. And what I think it does, which I, I know it does, is it really does add rigor to the curriculum, which I think is the ideal, the reason you use such a method. Um, and then ideally, if you're going right up, which you're what you're getting involved with, um, this is the method section of your paper. So thinking through this uh, really thoughtfully um, and intentionally uh, goes a long way. I'll point out certainly the fact that it goes in a circle um, and we'll go through that circle together, but then I also wanna point out all the interconnected arrows that make for this fancy design in the middle so that for instance, your goals and objectives really should directly inform the evaluation and feedback that you get. So are you meeting the goals and objectives of your curriculum? So again, not diving in depth to some of these meta, you know, things, but just wanted to sort of highlight it and show it, and then we can talk later about it some more. Um, so specifically back to PEM ECHO, we'll start with the problem identification and what is called a general needs assessment. Caitlin hit on some of these themes already related to EMSC, Emergency Medical Services for Children. And the statistic that haunts us, right, in the PEM community, which many of you know, of course, is that 80% of, 85% of children seek emergency medical care in their local community emergency department. But most of these see only about five to 10 patients a day. And most of those patients are quite low acuity. And so that statistic, that numbers game in and of itself is just really hard to prepare for. And so many places either can't or don't. Um, EMSC state partnership programs really is in existence to address this, this numeric challenge, right? And we have state partnership programs in all 50 states and many of the US territories, the mission is to ensure that any acutely ill or injured child receives the best emergency care wherever they seek it. Um, we use something called a pediatric readiness assessment, um, which is a tool that has excellent validity evidence that measures a community emergency department or in Caitlin's case, an EMS agency's pediatric readiness. And we know through the literature and really excellent studies that have come out fairly recently that high scores correlate nicely with decreases in pediatric morbidity and mortality from both injury and illness. We have found that the biggest driver of pediatric readiness is this idea of a PEC, this pediatric emergency care coordinator, which is simply an individual, oftentimes a physician or an APP or a nurse and or a nurse, I should say, that just sort of have an interest. They have a commitment to improving pediatric care in their local shops. Um, and the one thing that they have to do is liaise with their state partnership team and really kind of be in touch, uh, work, with the, work with us so that we can help them improve education, improve outcomes, improve the quality of care that kids receive in the community setting. Schematically, this is what EMSC is all about. We sit in the middle in Connecticut and work very collaboratively with the two children's hospitals there at Yale and Connecticut Children's. And I oversee as a medical director of initiatives that um, work towards improving readiness at community hospitals, and my colleague Mark Cicero works uh, on initiatives that improve pediatric readiness uh, in EMS agencies in Connecticut. So that's the general needs assessment. Our targeted needs assessment is the next step. And we had undertook a project um, through Yale in our transfer center with seven like high flyer, frequent referring um, regional hospitals that would send their kids to us all the time. And what we started to do was close feedback loops, right? We think that this is a good practice in general to know what happened to a patient that you've sent, you know, either down the highway or up the highway for the uh, pediatric hospital's care. And we did a qualitative analysis. We sat down with um, PECs at these different institutions after about a hundred or so cases had been transferred. And we did a pretty thorough qualitative analysis, but I'll just highlight one theme that's relevant to today's talk in that people felt that feedback and follow can create a big database of targeted patterns, like what's going on with pediatric emergency medicine in the state of Connecticut, where, what areas do we keep kind of circling back to that we can do better 
uh, in the community. And some stuff that came up was like use of high flow nasal cannula with bronchiolitis, um, how to manage the emergency airway of a child, the use of CAT scans for appendicitis, and the rest of the list that you guys can see. So these kind of helped shape what we were going to teach. Setting the goals and objectives. So again, general big lofty goals may or may not be able to measure them, so to speak, but our goal was to cultivate this community of practice, this group of providers that want to improve care, uh, pediatric emergency medicine care in the state of Connecticut. And we wanted to facilitate PEM knowledge translation and build PEM partnerships. The measurable cur curriculum objectives that we measured using immediate post um, curriculum surveys, and then we checked back in with participants about three to six months after, uh, we looked at did the uh, curriculum improve participants' perception of their PEM knowledge? Did we did they think it was a valuable use of their time? And then excitingly, like what did this curriculum inspire them to do locally? Like what QI projects or educational initiatives did they take on going forward? Um, this is the Kirkpatrick model for, for curriculum evaluation. As you can tell from setting those goals, right? Like the majority of which fell in this like reaction phase. Do we like the curriculum? Did we think we learned? Um, but we were really trying to figure out, can we can we sort of find a surrogate for what kind of impact um, did the curriculum have locally? Um, the educational strategies that we employed, we ended up having 13 one-hour sessions over the course of about uh, 13, 14 months or so. Uh, we had subject matter experts paired with community ED case reporters. We had a core PEM echo facilitator, so myself, Mark Auerbach, and Gunjin, uh, Tia Gura, who are on that first slide, we really sat down um, and reviewed each session's learning objectives to make sure it fit the ECHO model. Um, and the participants, that community of practice, if you will, were about 25 HECs and nurse educators from community EDs throughout Connecticut. The format of each session was pretty similar, right? So it would start with a content expert giving a 10-minute didactic of, you know, what the issue was. So use of CAT scans in appendicitis, for example. And then the community ED PEC would kind of give a presentation of a recent case um, that, were, that, that applied to the, the content of the day. Then the PEC would sort of present, and then here are the barriers that we face to implement ideal or gold standard pediatric emergency medicine care in our community setting. And then it would go out to discussion with the larger group. Um, what barriers do people have in their shops? What synergies can we think about uh, to, to avoid it? What new care plans and, and processes should we think about implementing together? And so it was a lot of good, lively discussion uh, going forward. And then finally, we asked the PECs to sort of amplify and disseminate some of the content that we went over during our sessions to their local care teams. And we did this by emailing and putting on a website, like different fact sheets related to the, the subject each, uh, each month. Again, sponsorship is everything. So if you have a, a curriculum that you're doing, don't just feel like you need to do it all yourself. Get your friends involved. They will appreciate it. Uh, those of us in medical education, right? We, we like having the opportunity to give these regional and national kind of talks. So this kind of stuff counts. So uh, get your friends involved. Um, implementation and piloting. I'll just, you know, invite everyone back to 2019 where Zoom was like a, a, like a what, you know, no one knew how to share a screen. No one knew how to come off mute, like kind of haunts me to this day. And so we were fortunate to work with the Connecticut chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics who did a lot of the logistics with us and made sure our technology was right, et cetera. We also were able to provide CME credits to, to physicians and this, the equivalent for nurses. Um, and again, obviously that facilitates attendance, um, but it does, there's like a cost to it. So it's just something to keep in mind as you think about implementing curriculums in your regions. Um, and then we did a lot of just sort of sitting down and meeting with content experts and PECs before each session to make sure, again, it met the flow of the echo. So there's a lot of piloting and a lot of considerations for implementation. Again, I alluded to this earlier when talking to go about goals and objectives, but our evaluation and feedback, we did that post-participation evaluation which collected self-reported perceptions about knowledge translation and the perceptions of the formation of community practice. And I'll spare you that there was like, you know, generally positive descriptive statistics uh, about that stuff. Uh, but what's really exciting and what I'm excited to share with you guys is that when we checked back in with the PECs months later, uh, we learned about some really exciting stuff that was going on that was inspired by our curriculum. So for instance, uh, a couple of a hospital um, did a pretty thorough quality improvement project to reduce CAT scan use when working at pediatric appendicitis. 
We had another hospital get involved and increase intranasal midazolam loose for simple procedures. Many hospitals implemented pediatric specific code cards. There were capital investments in high flow nasal cannula. Many folks um, started or integrated pediatric cases into their ongoing simulation series. Um, and you can read the list of different kind of projects that went on throughout our state as a result of getting involved. We also did different echoes going forward. Um, those that relate to PEM, you know, were specific um, to nursing or the PECs in and of itself. We talked about behavioral health emergencies and Dr. Katia Gura did an exceptionally cool one about child abuse and neglect. And then other PEM echoes, um, other non-PEM echoes, I should say, occurred through the mentorship of Mark and others at Yale. So reflecting, you know, wins and losses always, right? So I really love this opportunity to work with non-traditional like med ed learners. Um, again, I really felt like that bi-directional learning was, was, I learned so much, probably more than I could have ever imagined teaching in those sessions. And really thinking about that challenge that, you know, if 85% of children are seeking care outside of the fancy academic medical center, like what is the true role of PEM? It's really to reach our patients, not to expect them to come to us. So thinking about how we can practice um, in the community a bit better was really uh, motivating for me. Um, I would say, you know, kind of lo losses, if you will, like I just never know, like what's the right outcome to measure and specifically for an echo, right? Could it be neat to have measured, I don't know, maybe we would see increase in telehealth visits um, with these partner sites and that would maybe change practice or changes in referral patterns in these echo participant sites. Um, I think now, you know, like obviously you guys are lively and engaged, but Zoom fatigue is real. And so um, what's the best way to form these community of practices now where everyone who sees another Zoom meeting on their calendar can kind of have a, a deep breath of a oh boy. Um, and then sustainability, the norm is turnover. Um, I think we see it a lot in our pediatric centers, but my goodness, it's even worse in community emergency departments and EMS agencies. So this stuff consistently needs to be re-upped and, and sustained. So I think, I wish I sort of had a sustainability or a succession plan uh, you know, in place before we, we finished up what we were doing. Um, and so, you know, I, I'll save the rest of my remarks for our, uh, for our discussion and uh, thanks for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I had no idea that the amount of turnover and different providers, it's rare that I talk to somebody from referring hospital that's been there for, you know, 15 or, or 20 years. Um, and I shared the list of the experts. Hopefully they won't get spammed, but I look at that as a, a quite an impressive lineup of folks who know a lot about different topics. So I hope you're okay with me sharing that in the chat. Um, let's yeah. move on to Adam and then um, Diawodi, we'll start with a moderated discussion, but go ahead, Adam. Thanks, Brad. And I was a little nervous about sharing my screen after all those comments about Zoom. So I think we got it together. I hope everyone can see my screen. But um, I wanted to talk again just a little bit about empowering families and caregivers at discharge around symptom management videos. And so objectives for this talk really are just to understand my why and how I got into patient family experience and then sort of connect patient family experience to some clinical outcomes or recognize where those connections might not yet exist in pediatrics. Um, understand how to interpret the data that we've used to kind of come up with some of our interventions, and then uh, coordinate efforts to reach patients where they are, and lastly, recognize how to interpret the impact of some of those interventions. And so I think I wanted to start with just what is patient family experience, and I think everyone on this call is used to kind of being the right hand of the screen. Our report cards were filled with A's, we're used to being high achievers, and my first faculty job um, out of fellowship I got a patient experience scorecard and did not feel as though I had gotten A's and was trying to kind of reconcile what I was seeing in terms of comments, a lot of which I felt weren't attributable with this score that I was handed um, and didn't really understand how I was you know, supposed to interpret that. And then was met with a, an additional challenge of, we want you to improve this. Um, and, you know, again, leaning into the lack of attribution to some of the elements that were in there, I had to start to think, well, what makes this an important at all? And so um, I think that one of the questions I had to ask myself, well, what is the problem and, and why is patient family experience important? And so, um, again, um, as is often common in the literature, some of the PEDS data is uh, lacking behind adult data. So um, and this is certainly not meant to be exhaustive, but just some exemplars. Um, looking at um, adult uh, retrospective review of 3,000 uh, emergency departments who report to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, 
um, they essentially were able to align lots of different outcomes, including readmissions, representations to the emergency department with um, experience scores on um, the index visit. Looking at single center um, adult transitional cardiac uh, unit, um, this was, a, again, a retrospective study, but they were able to tie um, uh, experience in the discharge process to representation and readmission where uh, patients who had better experience were less likely to be readmitted to the hospital in 90 days after discharge. Um, those who were uh, felt that their social needs were met during their hospitalization were less likely to come back to the emergency department with six, within six months of discharge. And lastly, those who overall felt that their experience was uh, more positive had a lower six-month mortality. Um, within the pediatric realm, there are lots of uh, studies that look at communication, and communication gaps are certainly real. So they're in a qualitative retrospective, or a qualitative study, excuse me, um, families were sort of interviewed throughout their pediatric emergency experience to um, ascertain feedback around um, difficult words, difficult verbiage or conversation that had happened. And at least one third of families noted that at some point during their visit that they received confusing communication that left uh, that was um, suboptimally received. And most of that communication tended to ha happen right around the time of discharge. And then lastly, when trying to promote clinician and family partnerships, a qualitative study reviewed the interactions between um, providers and families and found that, you know, the way that we speak with families can either encourage, um, uh, cause uh, hindrances to the partnership or just completely miss it altogether. And so they really uh, tried to stress the need for engagement and understanding how to communicate more effectively with families. So... How did we figure out um, our needs related to patient family experience? And so I think firstly, I would be remiss without pointing out that um, uh, time in department, time to provider and wait times are probably the, the strongest uh, indicators of experience families want to get, get in, get seen and get out. And so um, when we kind of table that discussion and look at other factors um, associated with experience, we um, at Cincinnati Children's very important uh, very strongly want to get feedback from our families. And so this is looking at 12 months worth of um, um, patient encounters and the number of people that we've tried to seek feedback from after their visits is over 125,000 uh, uh, attempts. And we have about a 13% response, right? We uh, reach out to families initially via text and then by email and lastly by calling them and uh, that SMS is the the phone call and so or excuse me the IVR is the phone call and so you can see the breakdown of how families ultimately choose to respond to um, their experience surveys uh, in that circle below. We then utilize those responses to create what's called a priority matrix and so just to orient everyone to this slide we have on the bottom uh, row, that is our experience score. So we have a key performance indicator, the question of how would you rate your overall experience that is on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis is a correlation coefficient. So that takes every other question that's present in our survey and plots that, uh, compares that to um, the KPI question and then creates a correlate. So what we're looking for is, um, um, increased correlation, which shows us that particular questions are uh, correlating strongly with our KPI. And obviously, we want to promote moving in a rightward direction, which means that the experience was uh, optimized. So when we think about that, we have these two boxes that are our opportunities for improvement. The top right box or the green box, those are questions that when we look at them, we say we want to continue to promote that. We want to solidify that in our work so that we're able to optimize the way that we're delivering care to families. The top left box is the opportunities for improvement. These are things that correlate highly with how families experience overall uh, goes, but that we're perhaps not performing as strongly at. So um, when we looked at that top left box, those areas for improvement, what we found is that the, the questions that correlate strongly where we aren't maybe performing as well include, I got enough information about my child's diagnosis, I got enough information about treating my child's diagnosis, and I got enough information regarding manage my child's symptoms at home. And so thinking about what are the next steps, you know, uh, recognizing that most patients who present to an emergency department are ultimately discharged, 
we are entrusting these families to take on the delivery of care after they're discharged from the emergency department and found that this was pretty important to start to address to not just optimize experience and really thinking that it, of experience as a secondary outcome, but really promoting how we promote um, health and wellness of families after discharge. So we uh, started to think, well, how do we find our patients? And our plan initially, and this is right around the time that COVID happened, was to uh, work through our patients presenting with bronchiolitis because we found that that was a high volume patient. Um, there was a lot of um, uh, opportunities to learn. And so we planned for bronchiolitis and COVID happened and we lost all patients with bronchiolitis. So we went back to our drawing board, re-reviewed our data and came up with three symptom profiles that we felt might um, uh, adequately reach the largest number of patients. And so we uh, thought that we would create uh, some standardized communication around cough and congestion, fever management, as well as oral rehydration. Um, in our urgent cares alone, we found that uh, by creating just these three videos that we would reach 30 to 40% of all presentations that come to either one of our um, emergency department associated urgent cares or any of our neighborhood urgent cares. So what we then decided to tackle was the concept of um, varying uh, discharge instruction handouts. And so we recognized that um, there are options that are sort of embedded within our electronic medical record, as well as some um, homegrown discharge attachments that existed. And so we collated and created through um, sort of the powers of lots of uh, individual efforts and ultimately divisional uh, buy-in and agreement through their review, um, singular discharge attachments that kind of included all of the relevant information that we felt would be important for families to understand after they were discharged. Um, with these videos, we then created, or with these attachments, we then created discharge instruction videos the content of those videos kind of mirroring our um, attachments so that families were able to kind of follow along with the discharge attachment while they were watching the video. And we created a QR code that we included on those attachments so that family could, families could re-watch and re-review once they were home. And this included instructive things about how to administer rectal Tylenol, how to suction, how to offer oral feeds, and things of that nature. We then felt like we needed to be able to track and understand, was there any impact to our intervention? And so we created an ICD-10 list of diagnoses that we would continue to monitor. We recognized that this would not maybe hit every single patient who's observed a video, but that we were able to standardize the way that we were approaching monitoring um, and the impact of our interventions. So we, uh, then created a, an output um, in Power BI that uh, allowed us the opportunity to kind of uh, assess the impact of our interventions. Um, I highlighted two areas here. Um, we, uh, as you'll see on the next slide, related to our usage thus far, we're still on the upswing, but um, we have about a 2% uh, improve, uh, higher rate of, yes, I received enough information about my symptoms and diagnosis for patients who have watched those videos as opposed to those who have not with the associated ICD-10 codes. But when we look at how families ultimately rate their our facility, it's about 10, almost 11% higher in families who um, have seen the videos as opposed to those who have not. Um, and we'll talk about some opportunities for improvement and further understanding in another slide. So um, lastly, uh, one of the things that we wanted to understand is how do we enhance our reliability? And if it's not clear, we've used a lot of quality improvement methodology to, to move this project forward. Um, but we've relied for a very long time on human factors, um, specifically education, um, as well as re-education, um, all of which are low levels of reliability. And so we've uh, recently constructed a, um, a, a BPA that ties to certain um, orders that are placed within our EMR that uh, triggers the ordering of these videos so, such that if you order suction for a patient under a certain age that it asks uh, to order the cough congestion video. If you order Tylenol for fever, similarly, it does the same as well as oral rehydration or Zofran for nausea. So we have a, an ongoing 
control chart. And as this is not a terribly exciting um, overall percent of usage to date, we're right around 11% with a trend of, with the last five of our um, uh, data points being above our center line. But our BPA go live uh, will hit with our next data point, And I'm anticipating that we'll see a much higher uh, degree of engagement with use of the videos as we've uh, sought a higher level of reliability um, to ensure families are seeing these videos. So then the question becomes, where do we go from here? And I think, firstly, it's around family engagement and feedback. So we get feedback all the time where we're continuing to review these and are specifically looking for family callouts related to these videos um, within uh, our qualitative feedback that families provide. We're also able to look specifically at families who have viewed these videos um, and compare their qualitative feedback as, as compared to those who have not. We've also started to think about um, languages other than English. Uh, we have a very large Spanish speaking population in our uh, in Cincinnati. And so uh, we recognize that there are already disparities in care around communication with families who speak languages other than, Eng other than English. And so we've already created Spanish uh, attachments as well as videos to address that barrier. And our goal is to monitor the gap in um, um, some of our communication metrics uh, related to our uh, survey and make sure that we're not widening the gap with a goal of ultimately closing that gap. We're also looking at collaboration in topics such as asthma, thinking um, th uh, through how our primary care clinic is delivering um, asthma education and making sure we're aligning there and utilizing our resources such as our pulmonary clinic or our allergy clinic and specifically looking at inequities there around um, availability of um, rescue inhalers um, and, and um, um, presentations to the emergency department that might be inequitable. And then uh, similarly, looking at our concussion management, I think that this is one diagnosis that uh, has a lot of variability in terms of uh, communication with families about what to do once you leave. And so we intend to partner with our sports medicine colleagues who often see these patients and follow up for post-concussive syndrome to start addressing how we uh, more standardly communicate the next steps in management after their discharge from the emergency department. So with that, I will also stop sharing. And uh, when we get to this q and I'm happy to also take questions. Yeah. Adam, a quick question that came up from the audience is that uh, Mark Auerbach asked, are those videos available for others to use outside of Cincinnati Children's? They are. So they're actually all, they all exist on the Cincinnati Children's YouTube page. Um, one of our next steps, when as I first started this, was to look into how we don't recreate each other's work. And so uh, my sort of pie in the sky vision is to start partnering with folks who are working through standardized communication about how we might sort of share the work that we're all engaging in so that, you know, I'm not making a cough congestion video and that that video is being recreated all across the country, but we could sort of share in that. And I'm happy to send that um, for your review. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for your presentations. I learned a lot, um, even though I read through most of them already before. So I really appreciate you all taking time to share with us. Um, so let's get to some questions. So, um, Caitlin, this first one I'll have you answer. Um, why is this particular learner audience um, important to PEM physicians for PEM physicians to reach? And what um, what is different about these learners than your usual residents, students, or fellow audience? Sure. Um, I think, you know, this is an important learner audience because I think when we think about education for EMS, similar to um, education for the community ED, it really lets us impact the care of children who we will never meet, who never come through a pediatric emergency department. Um, and so, extending our impact outward into the community. I think we get that kind of ripple effect the same way when you teach an emergency medicine resident who grows and practices in the community. If you teach a paramedic, you're going to touch the lives of children that you're um, never seeing under your own care. I think there's a lot of differences in the learner audience. Um, the EMS folks in general are really experts in working under stressful situations. They make decisions quickly. They're in challenging social situations, uh, dangerous situations, and like the working under stress, multitasking, thinking quickly, like those are skills that they already have that you don't need to teach. And so it lets you step back a little bit and say like, what is the pediatric nuance that I can give them? How can I empower them to say, 
I'm really good at adult arrests. I do it every day, but I'm terrified of the pediatric arrest. And how can you kind of make them take that next step so that they can reach into the toolbox they already have and treat children with a little bit more nuance, with a little bit more confidence? I think the other difference for the EMS providers is there's like a lot of low hanging fruit. There's not much engagement for our pediatrics with EMS in general. So any pediatric training is going to be well received. Anything you can offer, any outreach or um, recognizing that they have a challenging job and you want to help them, like anything will be more than what they currently have from a pediatric standpoint. Um, and so it's not like a, a residency or fellowship where there's already a bells and whistles curriculum. It's like, there's nothing. And so if you give a little, that's a lot more than they already have. And so I think that makes it easier to get your foot in the door, so to speak. Awesome. Thank you. Adam, what about you? Um, I think Firstly, you know, when you think about patients and families, I think we are all trained to minimize jargon when we're talking to patients and families, but I think that that's really important in the emergency setting, whether the presentation is truly an emergent or urgent presentation. I think that families tend to believe that there is some level of urgency, uh, otherwise they wouldn't be there. Um, and so I think that it's sometimes hard to receive information in that in that mindset. And so I think that we have to recognize that um, in this instance, our learner is somebody who maybe doesn't have their full capacity to learn because of their worry and, and how that becomes a distraction. It's also, you know, long wait times, it's overnight, there's lots of things that contribute to making learning uh, a little bit more difficult. I think um, the uh, this is the audience that ultimately for most of the patients that we see is going to be responsible for the next steps, right? So we're discharging most of, most of the patients we see. And so, um, their understanding of what am I supposed to do? What can I do to help? What's wrong? And um, what can I do to harm, right? So, you know, medication dosing, dosing frequency, old antibiotics, safe sleep, all of those things that, you know, are contributors to potentiating harm. I think that, that those are things that families want to know. Um, so I think that really a focus on, you know, clear communication with what is it that I want to do? When should I come back? And then honestly, like a big part that we sometimes forget about is the lived experience of the learner, right? So I can tell you to, to get a nose freed up, but if that $15 that is, you know, electricity or dinner for the week, I think that it becomes challenging and you're sort of missing that connection and that opportunity for a family to feel empowered when they leave. Um, there was just a question in the chat for you, Adam. Um, is there a playlist with all of the patient videos on the uh, the channel, the children's channel on YouTube? There, so they all all of them are on there. It's not a playlist per se. They're all individually loaded, um, and I don't run it. I am so untech savvy, uh, which is funny that I'm doing this. But um, yeah, they're all sort of individually listed um, for the families. We have them on QR codes in the room, and now have tablets at the bedside that they're loaded onto. And then Brad just said we will share the links with everyone. I apologize for my COVID hair, but I definitely grew it out and I'm in one of the videos. So uh, uh, early apology for that. That hair was great though. I, I enjoyed it. Um, anyways, uh, next question. So um, for you, Adam, who are some of the most important non-medical stakeholders you've worked with um, and how do you assure that they have some buy-in? Yeah. And I think, you know, I've talked a lot about patients and families, and I still wanted to point that out as probably the, the first group. Um, I won't belabor that point too, too much as I've already talked about it. But I think other folks that I consider um, our health unit coordinators or our, our unit receptionists, um, they're really important for lots of things. Um, I spoke a little bit about um, non-English speaking patients, but we're starting to work on interventions to adequately identify families for whom English is not their primary language. Um, and we've come up with um, some built-in uh, EMR uh, uh, screen identifiers that help providers recognize that earlier so that we're not trying to spanglish our way through visits, um, but truly utilize interpreter services when they're appropriate. Speaking of interpreters, I think that they have been really important. They've been involved in a lot of our work um, as well as they're the folks who um, 
um, help to communicate our message at the bedside and also can recognize when there's maybe a discordance between um, what we perceive to be an understanding of the information we're trying to deliver. And so we've uh, in included them in a lot of our work. And then another group I would say is our child life, um, child life folks and our child advocates. Um, they've been helpful both with how we're delivering messages to patients and families in our waiting rooms. They've been involved in our um, discharge instruction videos about how to, how to deliver this content. And they're also um, really helpful with how we're providing interventions in real time at the bedside. And so I think having their input into um, the experience that the patients and families are going through while they're in the emergency department is really invaluable. And then thinking about how we get feedback, I think we utilize our surveys um, not just for the specific questions they they ask, but there's qualitative opportunities for families to kind of um, um, add their insights into their visit. And so we are regularly reviewing those for themes um, to help us guide if there's a particular um, um, issue that seems to be more common across you know, a period of time that we can start to uh, investigate and figure out if there's an intervention that's appropriate. And then we can also uh, more formally solicit feedback through something called community insights where families are, um, are able to sort of opt in to receiving regular um, surveys. And so if there's a survey for which they um, might be relevant for them to reply related to emergency department visits, they can feel free to kind of uh, actively engage in those surveys. Awesome. Uh, Michael, same question for you. Non-medical stakeholders, I've had some really enjoyable experiences over the years. Um, I was involved during my residency time with like a high school group of, of folks that were within our catchment area community in Washington Heights, New York City, who had an express interest in the health professional's career. Um, and so we were we brought them kind of like a health curriculum, education curriculum, and it was super fun just to interact with students of a completely different walk um, and, and level of training. Um, I've also had really lovely experiences, and, and this is kind of harder to do, but uh, figuring out how to form focus groups with parents and patients. Um, I had a, the pleasure of, of getting involved with a project fairly recent about really getting an understanding of the boarding crisis from the perspective and pa of patients and families and having those interactions uh, was really powerful, I think really informed some of my care, even the next shift that I was on. Um, and so, so, so um, yeah, th those have been two of the interesting non-medical stakeholders I've gotten to work with over the years. Awesome. Um, so Maito asked a great question in the chat. Um, with high, turn high turnover, how do you sustain the drive to educate EMS, um, PEC, or community ED personnel, especially with current environment of high staff or staff shortages and burnout? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think, you know, it's hard when we're all being pulled in a million directions to try to pull colleagues into just one more direction and do one more thing, teach one more group. Um, I think it's almost for us, I feel like it's been an anti-burnout a little bit um, in a like, uh, medical world in which we're overwhelmed, overrun, and feeling like not making a difference with the behavioral health crisis, can't admit anybody to the hospital, can't get anybody home. When you go teach the EMTs and paramedics, like you are doing something, you are helping somebody. It's very tangible and they're very grateful. Um, and so it like fills our cup a little bit in reverse. And I think, um, you know, to be kind of overworked, under-resourced and unappreciated is relatively new for the physician world, but like the EMS group has been overworked, under-resourced and underappreciated for a long time. And so just to have us come off the ivory tower a little bit and say like, your job is important. Thank you for doing it. We'd like to support you in doing it um, goes a long way for them too. And so even though you know we typically teach Boston EMS on Friday afternoons, which is everybody's favorite time to teach, but it actually like it's it's anti burnout, I would say, um, and so that helps keep us going back to it when it's like, oh, here's something I can do that people want to be here, want to learn. We're all in the same boat. We're one big team, and we leave feeling a little bit better than we go into it. So that's been psychologically effective for us. Yeah, 
I'll I just I, I agree with that. I love that answer so much. And I think that finding the things that fill your cup at work or with your extracurricular professional pursuits, not like the uh, the massage you get on the weekend or the bar you go to with your friends on Saturday night. Right. Like so finding those moments. And and so I think that's a huge piece of it. Um, all of our extracurricular pursuits require a ton of energy. Um, and so you better choose ones that like you're really passionate about or else teaching on a Friday afternoon <laughs> with an EMS group is going to feel like a real drag. So I think that making sure you choose wisely in your pursuits is, is like key. Um, and then I, I'll just sort of also say that, you know, if you feel as if we do something special with PEM, which I think everyone on this call probably does. And then if you agree that the statistic of most kids being seen outside of the ivory tower is like a big deal, um, that is very motivating in and of itself. Like that paradigm is something that I want to tackle. And I know Caitlin wants to tackle and I know many others uh, get really um, jazzed up to, to go after that problem. And so I think that helps to sustain the projects. And then the other comment that's just a bit more practical um, is to, to really think through a sustainability, um, like a succession plan almost. So you may come up with a project and then you work with someone who you feel like you're a good partner with. And I feel like very early on in the development of that, you should also be thinking about, so who's going to take this on in six months to a year and get them involved early and get them involved in a way that's like, hey, you're not taking over my project, but let's continue to build this together and then feel free to take it in your direction so people have ownership uh, going forward. So I think having a good line of folks that are, uh, you know, equally into the mission, um, but then are feel liberated to kind of take it in a little bit of a creative direction when they're kind of, when they take over the work, I think is, is a smart way to keep it sustained. Um, well, thanks for answering that question. I think that's something that is really important for all of us to think about as we move forward and think about how we're going to use these things that we've learned here. Um, so switching gears a little bit, um, as with any educational effort outside of our large facilities, we are faced with assuring that our interventions are sustainable. Um, what do you feel like is one of the most important um, pieces of feedback you've received to assure that you can keep making an impact over time? Michael, we'll start with you. Uh, so the most important piece of feedback um, that, I've, that I've gotten is, okay, sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Um, you know, in the in the planning phase, sounds like a good idea, but make it more rigorous, make it more methodologically, you know, rigorous. And and you hear that and it just sounds like more work to do, right? <laughs> Which is sort of like the initial reaction. Oh boy, back to the drawing board, more calls, more drafts, et cetera. Um, but I think there's two major benefits to following that feedback. The first, of course, and most importantly, is it should and it does make your curriculum better um and so going back to the drawing board and thinking about using something like current six step and thinking about all the different arrows and how they connect and are they connecting in the way i'm i'm designing this um is a difficult exercise but worth it in the end because it makes a better product um, and then as i alluded to during my talk like though you know if you're looking to make your career as a medical educator on Unfortunately or fortunately, like you still have these responsibilities to publish and to write your work up and to share it with the community. And if you take that step early, that write up part of it becomes a whole lot easier. It's already kind of done. It's sort of like the old comparison of, um, you know, if you submit an, a good IRB application or a good grant application, like most of your manuscript is already written when you go and kind of finalize your product. So it's the same idea. It's the same process in medical education have a method, really uh, pay a lot of attention to detail, and then ideally should be able to disseminate that work. Caitlin, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, important feedback I got kind of early on was making sure that our facilitators were had an understanding of EMS. Um, and, and when you're, you know, teaching an EMS provider and you're like, oh, well, next Kepra, it's like, well, there's there's no Kepra on the truck. Like you need to know what they stock. You need to know what they have. We'll have like, sometimes our fellows will be like, why didn't they put an IV in that kid? It's like, well, that's a, a BLS truck. Like they can't place an IV. That's not in their scope of practice. And so nothing went wrong. They just don't have that skill set. And so making sure um, when we kind of have our, our facilitators 
that they have an understanding of EMS. And I am lucky to work with a ton of really great med ed folks in Boston and tapped all of my resources to join this project. But a lot of them don't have a lot of EMS background. And so learning that early on, I made like a little facilitator guide every year when we go through the cases, we do like a little refresh of what scope of practice, what do they stock, how many people are on a crew, just so that we're not... um, taking ourselves out of the trauma bay and putting ourselves like back in the truck with maybe two people, maybe three people so that the recommendations we give, the expectations we have, the advice, the approach is relevant for somebody's living room on the floor and not in the trauma bay with four nurses. Um, And just recognizing that we lose street cred real quickly if we're telling them to do something that's not possible in their line of work. Um, And so kind of getting everybody there for the start. So, um, okay, so last question from me. If this uh, work isn't being done where, where, where you are, how do you recommend one might get started? Um, and what are the career and pe- professional development um, benefits to you and your colleagues um, that you've gotten from engaging in this work? Um, and we'll start with Adam first. Um, so to the first question, I think one one of the learnings that I had early in kind of developing research questions is understanding what your problem is. And so I think part of it is, do I have data to support doing something? Um, so, you know, for for myself, I, I don't know that the PFE score number has ever been the goal, but it's like, why does that number exist? Um, and so like looking at, you know, the factors that go into that. So I, you know, have a lot of involvement in flow and other opportunities for improving that secondary outcome of PFE. But like, I think that really understanding what is, what is my data source and what is, what is my problem? So do I need to, d- to design a preparatory study to kind of even understand what the problem is before I design an intervention? I think one of the things that uh, I w- tried to focus on is recognizing, you know, when you're, when you're assessing what your problem is and, or a a particular intervention is looking at something that's high yield, but, um, um, uh, not, uh, uh, a particularly, uh, problematic area to, uh, to intervene upon. And so we looked at where we were able to kind of uh, reduce costs, but hit the most number of patients by by looking through our data and understanding what's coming through our emergency department and urgent cares to try to design videos that would meet most families or at least a, a large number of families to start understanding not only how do these these interventions impact experience and other outcomes around like representations, but also does that have any impact on a metric that is important to the hospital, maybe a little less important to individual providers, and that's okay. Um, but I think that that um, thinking through how I can minimize the risks, and in this case, the risk being the cost of development of, of working with our EMR to embed this into the system of, of, of working with our technology team to get this on um, iPads at the bedside and all of those things. So um, trying to, to maximize gains with whatever intervention you're trying to employ. And I think, you know, from my perspective, quality improvement has been a helpful um, methodologic approach to this because it allowed for iterative uh, discussions, engagement with stakeholders, refining what we anticipated seeing, and then also learning when we when we saw things that we weren't anticipating. For example, um, families who speak Spanish, um, some of their communication scores after seeing these videos were actually lower um, than those who didn't, and what we what we were able to extrapolate from those conversations, and then refine how we were approaching um, utilization of videos in this in this cohort. So, I think really understanding what your data is to define your question, so that when you're informing whatever your intervention is going to be. It's not really just a shot in the dark. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Michael? Um, so specifically, if you're interested in, in working and in educating the p- folks in the pre-hospital setting and the community emergency department setting, I think a great place to start is to look up who is running your EMSC state partnership program uh, in your state. Uh, and ask sort of like, what do you got going on? How can I get involved? How can I help? And I promise you the answer is yes, that we are short staffed all the time and we have a lot of ideas, but it's, again, it's a bandwidth thing. And so if we meet an, an energetic person who wants to join up, I promise you, we'll, you know, folks will find 
uh, exciting things for you to get involved with. I think more general, uh, and I agree with Adam's sort of statement like that he just made is is really approaching the um, the the group, the next adventure, the next project or whatever, with an ask first mentality, with a sit and listen mentality and design your intervention next. Uh, I think it's oftentimes we think of like, oh, I just want to use this new intervention in a different setting or with a different learner group. But I, I don't find that that actually lands too well. So like get a sense of what the problem is, identify that problem. What is the local problem? And then really think through how you can use your ivory tower resources to help bridge some of that gap. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say like, Ultimately, the benefit that I think many of us have highlighted, there's like the professional advancement stuff, there's the, um, you know, all that, all that good stuff. But I would say like the ultimate benefit of, of teaching in these alternative care settings with these alternative groups of people is that I promise you, you're going to learn more than you teach. And if you're a dorky academician, like we are, like, that's fun. That's amazing. Um, it really is an incredibly energetic experience to, to go to a community emergency department and just like see how they handle stuff <laughs> and I, I like i said i i have i've learned more than i've taught in in all of these uh, opportunities awesome um caitlin any other thoughts yeah i mean i think just kind of echo what everybody said so far and, and thinking about um you know, what do you have to offer, but what do they need from you um, and what can be most impactful um, and and being able to adapt from there and, and kind of flex with the needs and flex with funding and flex with resources. And, you know, we're learning, we thought the bells and whistles of high fidelity was going to be um, the most exciting piece, but really like the debriefs with the PEMDOCs is the most exciting piece for the EMS folks. And they like to get the real-time feedback. They like to pick our brain about other challenging cases. And so so that lets us move some of our programming to low fidelity, save a bunch of money um, and do this for even longer. And so I think going in with a, um, a kind of an open mind, what do they need? What can we offer? And then reevaluating over time so that you can really tailor to where the meat is, is really helpful. Awesome. Hey, Dave, one other thing I would just, call, just about the kind of benefits uh, to ourselves and our colleagues, I would mention or be remiss to not mention that um pfe is often met with a groan <laughs> um and so i get lots of like sort of mm, or eye rolls and and i think that um for me I, one of the things that i try to reframe and try to think through is that you know the the these learners in this particular instance are here um uh, providing us with the opportunity to serve. And they, they are the reason that we chose to do what we're doing. And I think that um, educating patients and families offers them the um, reassurance that they are capable of uh, managing their child's symptoms at home. And it um, sort of helps to um, allay some fears around perceived urgent or emergent presentations and may have them kind of rethink the fever times one hour presentations that, you know, I think that I will speak for myself that has caused some consternation at 3.30 in the morning when I'm trying to clear the lobby. So um, I think that, you know, we like we have some benefits in terms of things like resource utilization by empowering families. And so like, yes, I, I try to always keep the that specific score as a secondary outcome when I'm thinking through what is my actual goal. And my goal isn't necessarily to um, uh, achieve a certain PFE score, although that, that is great. But I think that, you know, like the clinical outcomes and where we can and can re meet patients where they're at is more important and, and connect them with what's my next step. And um, those sorts of things uh, need to be the priority. And if we can counsel each other on those sort of priorities, then I think PFE is uh, less of a tough pill to swallow. So. Well, thank you all for that. Um, I wanted to see if you all had any final thoughts or words of wisdom as we close out. Adam, since you went last, any final thoughts, words of wisdom? No, I just appreciated the opportunity to chat and kind of share my, you know, what I've been working on and um, appreciate everybody's attention. So thank you so much. Caitlin? Yeah, same. I'm happy to be here and to be kind of with like-minded folks talking about important audiences and um, happy to be a part of the programming.
and Michael, last but not least. Oh, so much fun. Thanks for the invitation. I, I guess I'll just sort of say like the, all the, the presentations were clearly like abbreviated snapshots of what's been going on. I, I hope the whole idea of these groups is to facilitate further discussions and, and networking and whatnot. So please don't be shy and um, you know, our emails are, will, will be distributed or whatever. So like, let's keep talking. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you everyone uh, for coming. Brad, I don't know if you have anything, any last words you'd like to say? Yeah. To all of you who are awaiting the fellowship match results tomorrow, good luck. I know many of you mentored residents and wrote letters and spent a lot of time doing that. So I'd be remiss without saying good luck, knowing that it's less than 24 hours away. Um, thank you for all of our presenters. I will be sharing the recorded version um, along with your contact information to your peers and colleagues who want to reach out. Um, I put the links to all of Adam's videos, including his COVID hair, um, which is absolutely glorious. It's like long and flowing. Um, I'm very aspirational here um, in the chat. Um, and then any other information that our presenters want to share out, I will share with the group as well. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, guys.